Wonderful to see you again. I'm always pleased to do another teaching. My name's Maurice Barrett, and we're looking through the early church series. Uh, we're starting on my new book. We're going through the teachings. I'm quite excited about this. The early church series, for those who don't know, we're looking at the four things the early church did, Acts 2.42. It said they met together for the apostles' teaching, prayer, fellowship and breaking of bread. Well, we've looked at breaking of bread and I've written a book on it and we've done the series. We've looked at fellowship and I've also written a book on that. And I've just written a book on the apostles' teaching. It's available from Amazon as a Kindle download or paperback and it's available from the website uh, www.barrettministries.org.uk If you go to the menu and click on shop, you, you'll see all the books that I've written. This little study is really the preface to the book, before I go on to the Apostles' teaching, and I've called it Urgent Reformation Needed, or Another Reformation Needed. Let me give you a quote from uh, G.K. Chesterton. He says this, the reformer is always right about what's wrong. The reformation was wonderful. Martin Luther and many others saw what was wrong in Catholicism. But he said, however, he's often wrong about what is right. So although they saw many wrongs in the Catholic Church and tried to address them, there were many things that they thought were right that actually were wrong and they didn't adjust them. So instead of a 180 degree turn, the Reformation was only a 90 degree turn. I'm arguing that we need to go the other 90 degrees and complete what they should have done. I know in God's mercy and sovereignty that, you know, that was what was allowed. But now we need to get back. The Bible says right at the end before Babylon's destroyed, and I believe that's the, the Catholic Church that's becoming a one world religion, come out of her, my people, that you're not partakers of a judgment of her sins. And so now's the time to, to come out fully. Well, it's interesting, it's 500 years since the Reformation. Last year they celebrated the 500th anniversary. Uh, they celebrate it on October the 31st. And the Catholic Church have started to recognise it just a few years ago, which is interesting because after the Council of Trent, where they, they curse people who wouldn't agree with the Catholic doctrines, they, they've now recognised it. And I know why. It's because they're wooing and seducing the Protestants back into the fold. There's been a joint declaration between the Lutherans and the Catholic Church. 1999, on, on the day of the Reformation, 31st of October 1999, they made a joint declaration where they said that they believed now there was no need to protest anymore. So it's not a unity, it's Protestants going back to the Mother Church. You must never think there's a compromise. The Catholic Church never, ever, ever compromised. Don't be deceived. They word things very cleverly. The Jesuits are very educated, clever people, legalistic, and they put words that are very easy to understand and yet give a deceptive meaning. And so actually, the Lutherans have apologised in the Declaration. You can go online and read it. They've apologised for Martin Luther and the split that's caused damage to the body of Christ. Kenneth Copeland calls it a devilish thing, this split, when we're supposed to believe in unity. Very, very clever the way they word it. And it was ratified last year, on the, the 31st of October, on the very day of the Reformation of 500 years, the Lutherans signed the Declaration, it was ratified. The problem is, it's not only the Lutherans, the very ones who broke away with Martin Luther, the Anglican community and the Methodists have also signed and the faith and prosperity preachers for many years have been leading their congregations unbeknowing and unsuspecting into the Babylonian pagan doctrine of the Catholic Church. 
and as many denominations in the wings waiting to do so. My own denomination, Assemblies of God and the Pentecostals, I think maybe will be the last ones. But Kenneth Copeland's leading the, the Charismatics. They've been seduced since the 60s with the Jesuits. And Kenneth Copeland is leading the charge into the, the Catholic Church. But Billy Graham, this may surprise a lot of people and I may get criticism, but Billy Graham's led the way since the 50s. Billy Graham was their greatest prophet, the Jesuits, to, to bring Protestants into the Catholic Church. He preached many good sermons and many people have found God through it. I know God uses anything, but it doesn't alter the fact that he was a false prophet because his aim, it was Randolph Hearst who, who bulled him up and made him famous, a good Jesuit uh, Catholic. Uh, Randolph Hearst, the newspaper man, he made Billy Graham famous and the aim was slowly to bring the Protestants into the Catholic Church and he's done a very good job. He started by putting bishops on the platforms where he preached and sending people to the Catholic Church and slowly his doctrines have changed over the years. Go on the internet and check if you think Billy Graham's a wonderful man. Go on the internet and check. He was a mason, he was a Jesuit puppet, he, uh, he took honours from the Pope and it's too comprehensive to, for me to go into but the information's all there. What's the end of the plan? Well, the end of the plan is unity with the Catholic Church because that will be the one world church. I believe that the Pope is Antichrist, not the man of sin, the one world political data, uh, dictator. But the, the Catholic Church, their main sacramental um, practice is the Eucharist because they crucify Christ again. It's blasphemy. And they hold the host up, the Son. They worship the sun. And that's the aim. Pope Francis and President Yunnan stated together, let me read it to you. This is what they, they say, this is the aim. Many members of our communities yearn to receive the Eucharist at one table as the concrete expression of full unity. We experience the pain of those who share their whole lives but cannot share God's redeeming present at the Eucharist table. We acknowledge our joint pastoral responsibility to respond to the spiritual thirst and hunger of our people to be one in Christ. We long for this wound in the body of Christ to be healed. That's interesting because it talks in Revelation and Daniel about this beast that had the wound and was healed. The Reformation was a terrible wound to the Catholic Church, but it's being healed. There's restoration, there's unity coming again. And that's the goal of our ecumenical endeavours, which we wish to advance also by renewing our commitment to theological dialogue. But the end aim is that they can unite in the Eucharist. That's the aim. Because once we do that, once we commit that blasphemous act of crucifying Christ again, we're trapped. We, we start another inquisition. No man will buy or sell. It, it's, Christians have no idea what's coming on the earth. They, they, they're besotted by the doctrines of love and unity and they've no idea what's coming on the earth because they don't know the Bibles and they listen to preachers instead of reading the Bible. I remember 50 odd years ago, I was only a teenager, I remembered the first Council of World Churches, the beginning of ecumenism, the beginning of the One World Church. I think it was in Lusanne at the time and everyone was saying, isn't it wonderful, Billy Graham was going and different denominations were representing the people and they thought it was wonderful, but it was the beginning of the One World Church and it's now controlled by the Jesuits. They, they don't hold a council every year but the 10th World Council of Churches General Assembly was held in Busan Korea in 2013. 4,000 participants from 140 nations let me read that again 4,000 participants from 140 nations joined together under the theme living God lead us into righteousness and peace when you hear peace peace Sudden destruction. 140 nations, the World Council of Churches. That's how it, all embracing it is. 
So my firm belief is we need another reformation or we need to finish off the first one. Broke away from many unbiblical practices, but it was nowhere near a return to the early church model. That's what we need to do, get back to the early church model. And I'm hoping this book will expose some of the doctrines that we've uh, imbibed and taken on board. I've got a quote from Adam Tate, and it, it confirms what I've said. It says this, repentance is a 180 degree turn. That's repentance. It's going in the opposite way. Whereas reformation is only a 90 degree turn. The Jesuits are in control of all the Bible versions that's translated. The United Bible Society has embraced all of the translators, the Wycliffe's, and all the translators around the world. It's now controlled by the Jesuits. And they all use the Westcott and Hort translation. In fact, the modern versions are really Catholic Bibles. The Catholic Church has accepted NIV, SAV, and all the translations they've accepted. They've never actually accepted the authorised and taken it off the ban list, as far as I can research. If you know different, okay. But as far as I know, the Catholic Church have never taken the authorised version off the ban list. But they've embraced the new versions. So that tells you something of the... The, the way that the Bible translations are going towards a one-world Bible. Very clever, each version has a little bit more of a perversion and omission of the basic things. So, what are the, some of the things that they didn't turn from? They turned 90 degrees, but they didn't turn 180, and we need to turn the rest. For example, they kept the man-made distinction between clergy and laity, priests and people. That wasn't in the early church. But they, they've kept that division and we still have it, pastors and flock, and the pastors on the platform. There's nothing wrong with being on a platform if there's a large crowd. But we've still got that distinction. They still thought of buildings as the house of God. God now dwells in people, not buildings. You can't go to church to meet God. You can only go to, to a building to meet other Christians who have God in them. God now is in us. You are the temple of God, Paul says. Paul also says, don't you know, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost, the house, the tabernacle, the, the church of, of the Holy Ghost. And it's Christ in you, not Christ with you. Now Christ dwells in people. You are the church. You're the body of Christ. You can't go to church. And as soon as we make a building and call it the house of God, it's a pagan temple. There's nothing wrong with a building. We need buildings to meet in. I'm not against that. But as soon as you put a cross on it and some Christian artefacts, we're going back to Catholicism. We're going back to paganism. Because there are no temples now. There's no house of God. We are the... We are the temple of God. It never says go to church. It says don't forsake the assembling of yourself together. We need to meet for fellowship. And whether it's at a house or a building, I don't care. But you can't go to a building and call it the house of God and have special communion table and all those things. We're we'll getting into paganism because then we believe that there's something special and holy about the communion table or the stained glass windows or the candles. There's no need for any of that. God doesn't dwell in buildings. He dwells in us. They kept the pagan calendar. It's unbelievable to me that Martin Luther came out of the Catholic Church and the pagan calendar that the church had adopted, it wasn't God's calendar, the early church didn't keep it, That they, they, they kept the feasts, of course, uh, for a certain while, but the, the, the pagan calendar of Christmas and Easter and Ash Wednesday and Shrove Tuesday and Halloween, that every single day is pagan and not one of the Christian so-called calendar can be attributed to the Word of God. There's not one that you can reconcile with the Word of God. The nearest one may be Easter, which is near Passover, but Jesus died at Passover, not Easter, every day. And, and the gods were born on December the 25th. Jesus wasn't born on December the 25th. They've adopted a pagan calendar. We shouldn't have any holy days now. We're free. 
And yet we never broke free from it. We still keep the, that pagan calendar. Nearly all denominations adhere to it and there's no biblical authority for using any of it. Well, they kept many other religious practices and doctrines that I'm, I'm not going into. This is an introduction. But it's time to get back to the early church model and our biblical roots of what Jesus and the apostles taught. And that's what this series is about. What did Jesus and the apostles teach? Well, it's far too radical for any denomination to even consider to change. No denomination will ever change. They have too much to lose. They'll resist any move towards it. They're far too much to lose. They'd have to get rid of all the systems and all the organisation and the business meetings. They just couldn't do it. It's never happened ever yet. And the big mega churches of America now in Europe, South Africa, Asia, they'll never consider the big biblical roots. They'd have to change their indulgent and covetous lifestyle. They'd have to close the buildings that have become entertainment centres for self-centred believers. They won't be able to do it. The few who are looking for the straight gate and the narrow way and are convinced we need to change will be pushed out of these denominations. I'm prophesying it and I see it already happening. Those who want change will be pushed out because as they make a stand and criticise these great men of God who are actually false prophets, they'll be pushed out. And it's all right. It's God's way of bringing new life. That's God's way. The pagan church, Babylon, the mother of harlots, it's the mother, it's our mother. But a baby born to a prostitute is a virgin. And so when the mother, the baby gets too painful, this new birth, this new life, the, these people who want radical change, they get pushed out and actually it's birthed by Babylon. And so it's God's way. It's all right. That's how God brings revival. Every revival, it's people who've been too painful to stay in the mother church. If they stay, it'll kill it. A mother who doesn't get rid of the baby, the baby will kill the mother. It grows and grows and grows and it's time for it to be birthed. If it doesn't, it'll kill the mother. So it's pushed out by the mother, by the harlot. And it's a virgin and that's revival. It always happens, read your history. Christians don't seem to know history and how revivals happen. But they never change. You can't change Babylon, you can only leave her. Nobody's ever changed Babylon since Nebuchadnezzar took over God's people. When God put his people in Babylon, no one's ever been able to change Babylon. Martin Luther couldn't, he got pushed out. John Wesley couldn't, he got pushed out. The Pentecostals couldn't, the Baptists couldn't, the Anabaptists, the Huguenots, they couldn't change it. You never will. But you cause so much pain that you're pushed out, that's the way God causes revival and there's people coming out people are leaving the church to become the church now i've no i'm not asking people to leave the church the, the denomination the church has got to leave you you've got to be free of it if you have to leave you have to leave but I, you know i'm not advocating that that's none of my business i'm saying get babylon out of you first that's the first step just like when you leave the world, when you're saved and you leave the world, you've got, then got to get the world out of you. Sadly, it's not preached so Christians are worldly and are quite happy to be carnal and worldly. Whereas Jesus said, love not the world, it makes you spiritual adulteress and adulterer. You've got to get the world out of you. So it is when you get all your doctrines of Babylon, you've got to get them out of you, whether you're in the church or out of it. So, radical change is necessary. I trust as you go through these teachings, it'll give you a resolve to do away with your religious practices and concentrate on your relationship with God. I've seen many times people quote on Facebook, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. That's a lie. Christianity is a religion. By definition, it is a religion. There's no way around that. God doesn't want you to have a religion called Christianity. He wants you to have a relationship, but you can't have both. 
If you have a religion, you don't need a relationship because you've got your relationship with your religion, your denomination. If you've got a relationship, you don't need a religion, you're free. You can't mix them. That doesn't mean you can't go to an established church. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about being religious, belonging to a religion. Well, that's all that'll count when you stand before Jesus. I'm not talking about the great white throne for salvation. There's one billion Christians in the world who believe Jesus died for the sins and by that definition they're probably saved for eternity. But we've got to stand before the judgment seat of Christ to account for deeds done in our body. And that's all that will count your relationship with your potential husband Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. Paul says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in their body, according that he hath done, whether it's good or bad. So that's rewards or punishment. Don't tell me that God won't punish his own people, that they won't come under condemnation. I've just done a blog on YouTube, check it out, conviction of condemnation. There's plenty of condemnation on Christians if they don't live how Jesus told them to do at the judgment seat of Christ. There's no condemnation for the lake of fire to those in Christ Jesus. But there's condemnation if you walk in the flesh, not in the spirit. So let me warn you, you're going to have to stand before Christ at the judgment seat. And all that matters is your relationship with Christ. He may say, I don't know you. Well, there'll be no hiding place when the one world church and the one world order take over. It's nearly upon us. You won't be able to hide behind your denominations or traditions. If you've not obeyed the instructions of Jesus and the apostles, there'll be no hiding place. You'll have to give an account for your disobedience and resistance to conform to what the Bible actually tells us to do. Well, the study's finished. It's just an introduction. I trust you'll be challenged and motivated as you start this process to understand and to get out of Babylon as you face with the apostles' teaching. My whole motive is not to criticise people. It's not to be bigoted. My whole aim of this teaching is to help people to know the Bible and to know God and get out of religion because the time's short. So if you prefer reading than listening or watching this, the, uh, the books on the website www.barrettministries.org.uk I hope I've whet your appetite for this series. We'll start with study one next. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.